Welcome everyone to our Bible study. My name is Salvador Gomez and uh, we will now begin our topic will be the book of Daniel and the method of interpretation. Is it important? That's what we're going to find out uh, through this study. Okay. So one thing we need to do is to know how to avoid shame. Okay. Do we know what shame means? Shame means that we get embarrassed, right? We're embarrassed about something. When we don't uh, study uh, appropriately or the right way, then we can be ashamed. We can be ashamed, we can be embarrassed. If we're not um, careful to uh, study the Word of God the right way, notice what Second Timothy two fifteen says: "Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth." Okay, so. If we rightly divide or rightly study the Word of God, we will not be ashamed. Okay, so it's important, right? Otherwise, we will be ashamed. Now, if we do make a mistake, which we do, and I've, I can say in my own life, I've made a lot of mistakes when I've studied because I was not careful. Uh, to study it the right way. And so I also made mistakes. In order for others not to make mistakes, um, there's a right way to study. But if we do make a mistake, notice what this quote says. If they err, they make a mistake, that's what err means, they should be ready to confess thoroughly. Honesty of intention cannot stand as an excuse for not confessing errors. Confession would not lessen the confidence of the church in the messenger, and he would set a good example. A spirit of confession would be encouraged in the church, and sweet union would be the result. Okay, and so if we make a mistake, then it's okay. We just have to confess. Okay, and confess means that we say it. I made a mistake. I was wrong. Okay, say sorry, apologize. That's correct. Okay, but we must uh, be willing to um, admit. Okay, no word admit means right. We confess it. We have to say it. That's if we make a mistake. Now. Here's the warning, right? Everybody understands what that sign means right there, right? That yellow triangle with the exclamation point is a warning. Okay, you have to be very, um, pay close attention to this. It says, I have a warning for those who suppose that they have been given the work of revealing scripture in a new light. This work means substituting human interpretation for the interpretation that God has given. Thus did the heavenly messengers pronounce upon the effort into which brother Ballinger has entered. Okay, so the warning is, is that many times we want to interpret or try to teach something that God has already taught. And we change the interpretation. We change what it means. Okay? That's the warning. Okay? So we have to be careful not to try to interpret something that God already interpreted. God already told us what it is. And yet, we want to say, oh, no, it's not what God said. It's what I say. Okay? That's what it means right here. This work means substituting human interpretation 
for the interpretation that God has given. Okay? That's the warning. Now notice, the warning continues. My brother, this is talking about Brother Ballinger. You are in the presence of him who has never failed to accomplish his work or to fulfill his word. Bear not this message that you think means so much. In one way, it does mean much. It means the uprooting. You know what uproot means? Uh -huh. Cuando sacamos una planta de los raíces. Okay? That's what uproot means. When we take out the plant from the very bottom, from the very roots. It means uprooting of faith in God and making of infidels. An infidel is someone that doesn't believe in God. Okay? Cease from all such work. For it will open the door for many to depart from the faith once delivered to the saints and to give heed to seducing spirits. Okay, so the the work that Brother Bellinger was doing of interpreting with his own understanding, it says right here, it's seducing spirits. Remember we talked about the fallen angels, the demons? Mm -hmm. They're the ones that are whispering, whispering in, in the ears. Yeah, he's saying, yeah, you, he's saying, don't believe what God said, believe what I said. Yeah. Okay, and that's what's happening. Yeah. Okay, so that's why it's a warning. Don't do that. It's not good. Okay? Mm -hmm. Notice. So there's the, there's the right way. Right? When we go to the, to, um, for a drive, when we go, let's say, to the park, right? The, we see these, have you ever seen these signs right here? Yes. Right? Yep. The right way, right? Or one way. You have to follow the directions, right? You got to follow those directions. They're important. They're there for a, for a reason. Right? Follow the sign. Okay, so notice the right way. It says, my brother, you have been deceived yourself and have deceived others. You have not searched the scriptures in the right way. In the right way. You must search them to learn the mind of God. So when we search the scriptures, we learn to, to know who the mind of God. When we read the, the Bible, we are reading the mind of God. Not to prove your theory or what you believe. You read the word of God in the light of your own views. You build up a false structure and then barricade it with the text which you claim prove to be true. But you pass over those passages which prove it to be untrue. You say, the Bible is my foundation of faith. But is it? I answer, the Bible does not sustain your position. Again, you, you say, or you say, show me in the Bible that I'm wrong and I will give up my views. But how can you be convinced by the Bible as long as you rest and misapply its utterances? Okay. So, él dice, yo, te, yo estoy usando la Biblia para demostrar lo que yo creo. Pero, le cambia el sentido. Lo, lo misinterpreta. ¿eh? Lo, lo cambia a su manera. Ahí, ahí, he allí el problema. ¿eh? That's the problem there. Cuando lo interpretamos a nuestra manera o conveniencia. Mm -hmm. A nuestra manera o conveniencia. By so doing, you cut off the only source by which God might reach and convict you. Cuando le cambiamos a, a la palabra de Dios, cuando lo interpretamos de la manera que nos place a nosotros, uh -huh. nos cortamos de 
de la comunicación que Dios nos, nos quiere dar, ¿verdad? Porque le estamos cambiando a lo que Dios dice. ¿Sí? Sí. Ok. Very well. So there's a right way. The right way is to not what I say, but what God says. Mm -hmm. The only true way. Okay? Notice this quote. It says, the only true way to search the scriptures is to lay down every prejudice. Okay? Prejudice. Prejuicio. Okay? Número uno. Lay down every prejudice. Every preconceived opinion. Prejuicios y opiniones que ya hemos tenido antes. Tenemos que hacer de ellos un lado. We have to put those things aside. At the very door of investigation. Okay? Entonces a la puerta de la investigación, ahí se queda. Todo lo que antes creía, ¿verdad? Todo lo que era, lo que yo pensaba lo que era. Esas cosas se tienen que quedar allí. Ok. And then... Enter into the work with an eye single to the glory of God. With an understanding of open to conviction. And a heart softened to believe what the Lord says to you. Okay. Eso es lo que se hace cuando estamos investigando algo. Okay? Algo que no... No estamos seguros, no, no, um, hay alguna cosa que simplemente aquí no cuadra, ¿verdad? Entonces tenemos que poner pues nuestras ideas a un lado. Solamente si es que no, no hay este, no cuadra algo, ¿ok? Solamente bajo esas circunstancias. And it has to be clear. Under those circumstances, then we need to we need to investigate. We need to study. It. Pero cuando algo ya está claro, ya está bien investigado, ya está bien cuadrado, o sea, todo está. No hay preguntas. Entonces, ya no es algo que se tiene que investigar. ¿Sí me explico? When something is already made plain, well understood, there's no need to investigate. There's no need to have to study it all out with anybody. If that person doesn't see it, then that's an issue that that person, he has to investigate. And he has to accept what is true. We don't have to investigate it no more. No tenemos que gastar tiempo. We don't have to waste any time Studying out something that is already clear. Okay? So, in order for us to come to a proper understanding of what God says, we must use the adopted rules um, by William Miller. And here we have the endorsement. Okay? An endorsement is something that God says, okay, You listen to what this person says because they are inspired, okay? We understand that the, Ellen White was inspired. She was there when William Miller was preaching and teaching, and she also heard about the rules. Okay, so let's listen what she says. Those who are engaged in proclaiming the third angel's message are searching the scriptures, investigating, the scriptures upon the same plan that Father Miller adopted. In the little book entitled Views of the Prophecies and Prophetic Chron Chronology, Father Miller gives the following simple but intelligent and important rules for Bible study and interpretation. Okay? So, if anybody claims to be giving the first, second, and third angel's message, they must be using the rules. They must be give, using the rules. If they do not use the rules, they are not giving the three angel's messages. Okay? 
And so we've studied the messages. We studied the rules already, right? And so right here, uh, for those of you that are watching um, upon my page and upon uh, the YouTube page, we have the study available. Perhaps I could put a link here um, for those to study um, or watch the that video. Uh, here are the rules. We're not gonna go to go through them here, but I have placed them here so that people can see that they do exist. Okay, there are fourteen rules of interpretation for the study of the prophecies. Okay, here's what William Miller said about how he came to understand these rules. Okay. He said, I determined to lay aside all my prepossessions. Remember what, what we read just a little while ago? All my preconceived ideas, all, everything that I understood before, um, before I began to study. Willem Miller, at one point, was a deist, remember? He didn't believe in the Bible. And so he had to put that aside. He had to lay aside all of his ideas about what he thought. See? So this was a difficult matter, you know, for him to be able to, okay, clear my mind. I can't, I can't think that way right now. I have to give it a chance. I have to look at what, what the Bible says. He says, I determined to lay aside all my prepossessions, everything that I believed before, to thoroughly compare scripture with scripture and to pursue its study in a regular and methodical manner. So he found that there was a method, un método, un control, que había un método para poder estudiar, y eso era comparando las escrituras. He says, I commenced with Genesis and read verse by verse, proceeding no faster than the meaning of the several passages should be so introduced as to leave me free from embarrassment. Remember, study to show yourself approved, okay, so that we won't be ashamed. <clears throat> Respecting any mysticism, uh, excuse me, mysticism. <coughs> Give me a moment. <clears throat> Respecting any mysticisms or contradiction. Whenever I found anything obscure or difficult to understand, that's what that obscure means, my practice was to compare it with all collateral passages. Any, anything that was connected to that thing that he couldn't understand, he looked for it somewhere else. And by the help of Cruden, which is the um, um, concordance that he used, and it has, if anybody has ever used a, a concordance, a concordance gives you the whatever word that you're looking for, and it gives you all the Bible verses, all the Bible verses that talk, that say that word. Okay. Una concordancia es un libro, casi como un diccionario, pero tienen la la palabra que estás buscando y luego los versos donde se encuentra esa palabra y es lo que él usaba para poder llegar a una conclusión más sólida, ¿verdad? Porque a veces era algo muy oscuro, no podía entender muy bien, pero cuando Lo buscó en la corcolán. Oh, ahí está. ¿Verdad? Un verso era difícil, pero el otro verso era más fácil de entender qué es lo que estaba diciendo. ¿Ok? Ok. Lo dice, <clears throat> whenever I found, oh, and by the help of Cruden, I examined all the texts. ¿Eh? Examinó todos los textos que estaban ahí en la corcolancia of scripture in which were found any of the prominent words contained in any obscure portion, okay? <clears throat> Let's 
sigue diciendo. He continues, then by letting every word have its proper bearing on the subject of the text, if my view of it harmonized with every collateral passage in the Bible, it ceased to be a difficulty. In this way, I pursued the study of the Bible. In my first perusal of it for about two years and was fully satisfied that it is its own interpreter. Okay? Ahí está la clave. That it is its own interpreter. La Biblia se tiene que interpretar por, sol, por sí sola. It must interpret itself. God is the interpreter. Not me. Not the pastor. Not anybody else. Any church official. The Bible must give us the answer. The Bible must explain itself. Okay? Now, I found that by a comparison of scripture with history, okay, entonces aquí se compara la escritura también con la historia. En cuanto a las profecías, okay? También se comparó la escritura con la historia. All the prophecies as far as they have been fulfilled. En cuanto a las Profecies que ya se cumplieron, dice, had been fulfilled literally. Se cumplieron literalmente, dice. That all the various figures, metaphors, parables, similitudes, etc. of the Bible were either explained in their immediate connection or the terms in which they were expressed were defined in other portions of the word. And when thus explained, are to be literally understood in accordance with such explanation. I was thus satisfied that the Bible is a system of revealed truth. Okay. Entonces, en porciones donde hay cosas figurativas, ¿eh? cuando se dio a entender que era esa figura ya se intercambiaba por lo que era figurativo a lo que era literalmente. ¿verdad? Y así vio que la historia y la, la profecía se cumplía literalmente. Pero eso solamente es cuando se usaban las figuras. Porque hay profecías que no hay figuras. ¿Ok? Entonces tengamos eso en mente. ¿verdad? Pero todo se tenía que comparar con lo que decía la Biblia. Y cada cosa tenía que alinearse con lo que dice la Biblia. Ok. Sigamos. I think it was pretty clear in English. No creo que se ocupa la explicación en inglés. <coughs> ok. Ahora vamos a entrar a una de las reglas. Rule number seven says... Visions are always mentioned as such. And if anybody wants to look up uh, 2 Corinthians 12.1, Paul is making it very clear that in he, he was in vision. <clears throat> and uh, that's, the, that's the verse that we use as a um, evidence. To prove that this rule does exist. Um, and you can look in the book of Daniel as well. He talks about being in vision um, more than once. And uh, the Bible makes it clear when it's a vision is being given. He gives it to the prophet. Okay. Now let's notice Daniel's last great vision. Okay. And I, Daniel... This is in Daniel chapter 10, um, verse 7. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. See? What's Daniel saying? That he had a vision, right? For the men that were with me saw not the vision. So Daniel alone saw it. 
but a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore, I was left alone and saw the great vision. And there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned into corruption, and I retained no strength. Okay, so here, it's very clear that Daniel is in vision, right? Okay. Rule number eight. Figures always have a figurative meaning. And so everybody knows what the figures are, right? Symbols. Symbols. And are used much in prophecy to represent future things, times, and events. Such as mountains, meaning governments. Okay, and if you want to look up those verses, we can, we can find um, different times that the figures are being used. Okay, we're not going to do that now. <clears throat> We refer you to the rules. Now notice in Daniel chapter 11, verse 24, there is one figure. It says, He shall enter peaceably, even upon the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his, his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches, yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds, notice, even for a time, okay? So that time in prophecy represents a length of time. And we know that one time in Bible prophecy represents a year, okay? So that prophetic year was from 31 BC all the way to 330 AD because this is what that famous battle was called, the Battle of Acme between Octavian and Mark Anthony. Okay. This, this is the only figure that, that we find in Daniel chapter 11, the time, even for a time, 360 years is one year, or 360 days, excuse me, <clears throat> is, a, is a prophetic year, okay, each day is a year, mm -hmm. so, and we'll get into this some more. We'll, we'll do some more explanation on this. But just for the time being, mm -hmm. we see that in Daniel 11, there's one figure. And that's this verse right here. Now notice, the figure mountain, Daniel 2.44. Uh, I mean, excuse me, Daniel 2.35 and 2.44. It's going to explain what a mountain means in Bible prophecy. Okay. And it says, And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And so right here we have the symbol. The great mountain is a symbol of something. Verse 44 is going to give us, God is going to give us what the meaning is. Okay? The mountain. Notice. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom okay so what is the mountain is the kingdom is the kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever y ese kingdom viene siendo el reino de Dios. Que va a ser lo único que va a per permanecer después que destruye a las naciones, a los reinos. Es el reino que queda y dice que esa piedra se convierte en una montaña grande. ¿Ya? 
y es el reino de Dios que permanece para siempre. Now, rule number 11, literal verse figurative. Lo literal en contra de lo figu figurativo, ¿ok? Nota, esto es la regla número 11. If a word makes good sense as it stands and does no violence to the simple laws of nature, it is to be understood literally, if not figuratively. Okay. Entonces, otra vez. Does everybody see the beast? They're coming up out of the ocean. The lion, the bear, mm -hmm. and then the, the leopard with four rings, four wings and stuff. Oh, mm -hmm. Three, four. And then there's another terrible beast in the back with a black shadow. And they're coming up out of the sea. Have you ever seen a beast come up out of the sea? Oh, huh. Never? Like a lion coming up out of the waters? No. What about a bear? Did you ever see a bear coming up out of the water? Never. Those are going against the nature, right? They're, they're not natural. And so we know that these are symbols. They represent something. Okay? For these things, we need to go through the Bible and find out what it means. Okay? But when it's not coming up out of the the sea and it's not breaking the laws of nature then it's literal then we don't have to look for it we already know what it is it doesn't need to be found make sense uh -huh. Son cosas naturales, se puede decir. they're natural so we know that that's what it is we don't have to go find other bible verses to figure it out It's being very plain in the language. Nota. Take note of, uh, of uh, William Miller, what is said of him. This is his way of reading the Bible. What he read, and we read this last um, Sabbath, um, because we read about a little bit about his life. And so we're going to read it again. Notice Mr. Miller is a great stickler of literal interpretations. Okay. So that tells me that when he reads the Bible, the first thing he, <clears throat> he thought about what he was reading was that it was literal. And unless he saw that the nature, it wasn't being, uh, there was no violence being done to, to nature. As long as there wasn't a beast coming up out of the waters or a woman riding a beast, something like that. Uh -huh. As long as he didn't see that, then he took it literal. And he was a great stickler. That means, él se apegaba a lo literal. That's what that word means. That he stuck to the literal. Always. Unless he needed to. Unless he, the word was giving uh, violence to the laws of nature. But he always read it first as though it was literal. That's the first thought. Okay. That is the same type of mentality that we need to have. First first literal and then if you see any reason to think that it's symbolic it, remember it has to break the laws of nature tiene que quebrantar las leyes de, de la naturaleza para que digas oh pues está quebrantando esa ley es simbólico ¿Sí? I'm gonna finish What it says here, never admitting the figurative unless absolutely required to make correct sense. Okay. okay. In Daniel 11, también se habla acerca de una montaña. Okay, recuerden, we already read that 
in Daniel chapter 2, it speaks of a great mountain, right? In Daniel 11, it also mentions a mountain. But there's a difference, right? Because in Daniel 2, we notice that there's symbols, right? The great statue, right? Remember the different nations, different gold, different uh, metals. Okay, and then the rock hits that those are all figures, right? They're not things that we see all the time. Now we're going to look to see if this verse breaks the laws of nature. Vamos a ver si este verso quebranta las leyes de, de la naturaleza. Daniel 11, 45 dice, And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Okay. There's talking about a mountain. Right? A glorious holy mountain. Is that breaking the laws of nature? Quebranta las leyes de, de la naturaleza? De alguna manera? De qué manera? Léelo. Léelo. Cinco. Y plantará las tiendas de su palacio entre los mares. Entre los mares. mares. Entonces, hay dos mares. Entre él, ok. Ok. Ahora, entre los mares. Y el monte glorioso y santo. Entonces, ese monte glorioso está entre los mares. Ok. ¿Es, es literal o es simbólico? Literal. Es literal. Porque no está, no está de alguna manera quebrantando las leyes de la, de la naturaleza. Habla acerca de dos mares, ¿verdad? Y luego nos dice que hay ese santo monte entre medio. Pero sabes que confundí aquí porque dice entre los mares, como que si fuera encima de, de los mares. Ya. Entonces, mar. si, es, si, si eso dijera, entonces ahí ya eso no es natural. De que haya un monte encima del mar, no. Eso no. Eso quebranta la ley de la uh -huh. naturaleza. Pero aquí dice entre los mares. Okay. Entre medio. ¿Verdad? Entonces, el lenguaje bien clarito. Bien sencillo. Lo primero que tenemos que ver aquí es que no, no, no quebranta la, las uh -huh. leyes. Entonces, todo lo que estamos leyendo aquí es literal. Pero si yo le pongo otro significado a lo que dice aquí, vamos a decir que digo yo, oh, esto ha de estar hablando de la iglesia de Dios. Entonces, ¿qué cambia? La interpretación. Ya no es lo que Dios dijo, es lo que yo estoy diciendo. Le estoy cambiando la interpretación. Y al cambiarle eso, también cambia todo. Cam cambia el mar, los mares, cambia este, el, um, hasta la persona a quien se refiere. ¿Sí? Pero bueno, sabemos que no es figurativo, sabemos que es literal. No hay para qué cambiarle el significado. Porque al cambiar el significado, cambiamos todo. Uh -huh. Y ya tendríamos otra profecía que ni siquiera es. Inventada por, Inventada el, por el hombre. Y ya, ya leímos que hay, una, hay un aviso, un uh -huh. warning. There's a warning against those that change the meaning, the plain meaning of God's word. Uh -huh. ¿Sí? And so just so... Everybody else can hear it. If I were to change the meaning of the glorious holy mountain and make it a figure, well, that would change everything. That would change what the seas mean. That would change even uh, who is being referred to as he that 
shall plant the tabernacles of his palace, it changes everything. And by doing that, we are doing just that which Brother Ballinger did. And that's placed my human interpretation above the interpretation that God has given. Seeing that it's literal, seeing that there is no need to make any change or try to make a figure of that which is literal. We end up um, not using the, 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 the rules. See, because the only time we need to use uh, the, the figurative rule is when we see figures. Y otra cosa es, también es que tal vez lo, estaba, lo estabas leyendo muy rápido, yo tal vez lo estaba leyendo muy rápido, y tú lo, por cómo lo escuchaste, pensabas que era en, ajá. Pero al leerlo así lento, ¿verdad? tomando nuestro tiempo, asegurando que estamos leyendo bien, ya se aclara todo. ¿verdad? Sí, y siempre es bueno tener como alguien que lo guía porque desafortunadamente muchos no tenemos esa facilidad de discernir mm. lo que es en la interpretación y la confundimos ¿verdad? y si sí tenemos es lo bueno que si sí tenemos personas que ya estudiaron todas esas profecías y llegaron a la conclusión correcta en cuanto a ellas y por eso es que hoy en día puedo decir que en lo que pensaba lo que era antes estaba incorrecto, estaba equivocado. Yo estaba, uh, me estaba uh, dejando llevar por lo que decían los demás sin estudiarlo por mí mismo. Y al estudiarlo bien, ya me di cuenta, me di cuenta que estaba yo equivocado. I was wrong in what I understood before. The great majority understand this glory, glorious holy mountain to be the church but it's not we have to believe it just like god says it it's literal there's no reason to make it a figure okay rule number 12 this is called the proof text method okay and we talked about how william miller did this he compared scripture with scripture making sure that he understood what the words meant okay to learn the meaning of a figure okay para conocer lo que es la figura dice trace the word through your bible and when you have found it explained substitute the explanation for the word used and if it makes good sense you need not look further if not look again okay entonces cuando estamos viendo las figuras para conocer qué es esa figura, tenemos que buscar en toda la Biblia esa palabra o esa figura. Al buscar las figuras, las figuras en otras partes de la Biblia nos dice qué significa. ¿Verdad? Por ejemplo, let's give a, an example. Here. La palabra en la figura de los, um, la palabra de, la, de los vírgenes o la, de las vírgenes. Ahí nos habla acerca de que te, les hacía falta aceite. Entonces, para saber qué, de qué está hablando, pues tendríamos que ver a través de la Biblia el aceite. ¿Qué dice Dios acerca del aceite? Nos lleva al libro de Zacarías. ¿Te recuerdas que estudiamos eso? Y habla acerca de los, los dos árboles de oliva y que entre ellos salía qué? Aceite. Y luego, en cuanto a ese aceite, dice que es 
no con fuerza ni con poder, sino con el Espíritu de Dios. Entonces allí nos dice qué significa el aceite, es el Espíritu. El Espíritu, entonces les hacía falta, ya no es el aceite, sino el Espíritu. Por eso es que los cinco fatuas no, no entraron, porque les hacía falta el aceite o el Espíritu. Muy bien. Uh, just giving the example, para traducirlo en inglés, the example of the, of the parable in In uh, Matthew 25, it speaks of uh, the virgins, ten virgins, five wise, five foolish, and five of them lack oil. And so we have to figure out what that oil represents because those, these are figures in the Bible, right? And so we just, all we have to do is look up in the Bible where it talks about oil. And that takes us to the book of Zechariah, where um, he saw two olive trees. And from those olive trees were pipes going, uh, going into a lamp. And in the bowl, there was oil being drawn. And then within those verses, he says, not by, by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. So that's where we find out that the oil represents the Holy Spirit. And so now all we do is take away the figure, which is oil, and we replace it with that, what it means, Holy Spirit. So what is it that they lack? The Holy Spirit. See? And that's what we do with all the prophecies. We find out what the figure is, and then we replace it with that, What it means. Mm -hmm. Okay. Notice what William Miller said here. I found that by a comparison of scripture with history, all the prophecies, as far as they have been fulfilled, had been fulfilled literally. That all the various figures and metaphors, parables, similitudes, etc. of the Bible were, were, were either explained in their immediate connection or... The terms in which they were expressed were defined in other portions of the word. And when thus explained, are to be literally understood in accordance with such explanation. Okay, and so, again, when we have to find the, the meaning of the figure in prophecy, once we find out what it means, we replace it with that which it means. Always remember that it goes for the figure and it also goes for prophetic symbols um, or events. I'm going to finish what it says here. I was thus satisfied that the Bible is a system of revealed truth. Rule number 13, to know whether we have the true historical event for the fulfillment of prophecy If you find every word of the prophecy after the figures are understood is literally fulfilled, then you may know that your history is the true event. And so in order for us to know that we have the true event found in, in prophecy, every word about that prophecy needs to line up with. Se tiene que alinear cada palabra con el evento. Si no se alinea con ese evento, entonces tenemos que seguir buscando en la historia o tal vez se tiene que um, uh, has to be fulfilled in the future. Se va a cumplir en el futuro. Si no la encontramos ya en la historia, pero cada palabra tiene que alinearse con la profecía en la historia. Tienen que acoplarse Okay. Um, is literally fulfilled, then you may know that your history is true, is, is the true event. But if one word lacks a fulfillment, y si nomás hay una palabra que no, 
no es que está de acuerdo, si una palabra no está de acuerdo o no, no se encuentra en la historia, solamente una cosa, que no esté de acuerdo, no, no es, no cuenta. If one word lacks to fulfillment, then you must look for another event or wait for its future development. For God takes care that history and prophecy shall agree so that the true believing children of God may never be ashamed. ¿Sí? O sea, todo tiene que estar de acuerdo porque si no, vamos a, nos vamos a avergonzar. Wow. Nos vamos a avergonzar. Exactamente. Exactamente. Ok. Daniel 11, 36. Daniel 11, 36. Here's the correct view. Vamos, vamos viendo acerca de Daniel capítulo 11, porque el Daniel 11 no hay figuras, realmente. Ya leímos una. Pero de acuerdo a todo lo que leímos en Daniel 11. 36. Ajá, Daniel 11, 36. Daniel 11. Okay. <laughs> okay, so in Daniel 11, we find that there are hardly any figures. There was only one figure that we can see. And that was a time, okay, a time prophecy, one prophetic year. But notice what it says here in Daniel 11, 36. We have to realize whether or not these words are figurative. And we know that the figure is something that doesn't make any sense. It's, it's breaking the laws of nature, okay? So does it break the laws of nature? And the king shall do according to his will. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God and shall speak marvelous things against the God of God and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done. Verse 37, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers nor the desire of women nor regard any God For he shall magnify himself above all. Okay. Vemos aquí que hay algún. Do we see any symbols or any? Is it breaking the laws of nature? No. Nothing. Okay. There's nothing. Ok, now, la dificultad aquí, the difficulty that we find here is that there are similar things that are being said about this king that is said about the Catholic power or the papacy. Ok, de igual manera encontramos acerca del papado que dice que también se magnifica, o sea, se engrandece. De tal manera, ¿verdad? Pero hay algo acerca de este rey que no se dice acerca del, del papado. ¿Sí? No. Hay algo que se dice acerca de este rey que no se dice del papado. There's something that's being said about this king here that it cannot be said about the papacy. And it's in blue. And he shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. And for that, that is determined shall be done. Okay. Eso. Y luego también el verso 37. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers for he shall magnify himself above all. Eso nunca se ha dicho del papado. 
porque este rey dice que se magnifica de tal manera que es más de Dios. O sea, da a entender que no cree en Dios. For he shall speak marvelous things against the God of God. El papado es, es una uh, iglesia cristiana. Es una iglesia cristiana. Entonces, él cree en Dios. Aunque también se cree Dios. ¿Verdad? Pero este rey habla en contra de Dios por completo. Es un rey. Un rey que llevó cautivo a la iglesia católica, al papado. Durante el... No, son constantinos de la iglesia católica. Es el fundador, más bien. Francia. Francia. Lo vamos a estudiar. Pero fue Francia que declaró en la revolución francesa de que no hay Dios. Que no hay Dios. Y también, este, donde dice, uh, nor the desire of women, esta palabra women es esposa. Que el matrimonio deshicieron con, con ese rito también. Con esta institu institución. ¿Te recuerdas? We, we read about the two institutions. Las dos de Dios en la creación. La primera era matrimonio, esa francés lo, lo quitó por completo did away with the marriage institution in 1798 no respetaron el matrimonio entre hombre y mujer ya no ya no usaban no ya no hay después de eso durante ese tiempo de la revolución francesa se deshicieron de esa de esa institución porque si se hizo un uh, una nación atea ¿verdad? porque el matrimonio de, bien, de dónde viene de Dios. de Dios ¿me entiendes? entonces estos este rey aquí se deshizo de todo lo que era de, de Dios. Todo. Por Todos completo. Los todo. Pero la culpa, la culpa no era, no era Dios, sino el papado, que dio mal testimonio acerca de lo que era Dios. Y por eso fue, fue a cautivar al papado, a terminar con esa, esa iglesia. Durante ese tiempo. ¿verdad? Fue una de las primeras cosas que hizo. Y luego trató de conquistar al mundo. Francia. Sí. Pero esto aquí nunca se puede aplicar a, a, al papado. Sin embargo, hay muchos que creen eso. Pero le tienen, no, no cabe todo esto con lo que se dice del papado. Por eso lo tengo en diferentes colores. Okay. El papado se ha magnificado. ¿eh? Se ha hecho por encima, Bien, como quien dice, por encima de Dios. He has exalted himself above God in that he created another day, Sunday. But it has never been said that the papacy has done away with God. And that's what the verse is saying. The verse is that he is above the God of gods. And, and uh, he magnifies himself above all. Ni siquiera los dioses paganos. Nada, completamente nada. ¿Verdad? Entonces, aquí, como lo habíamos leído en, el, en, el ver, en la regla, cada palabra tiene que estar alineado. Every word has to be fulfilled. Every word has to fit. 
and we're gonna study it. We're gonna look at it, right? The reason why we're looking at it right now is because it's going to be, we're gonna read about this in the future. And this is the attitude that we need to come. Um, we need to approach it in the way that it's written. Every word must be looked at. Every word must be examined and must be fulfilled in accordance with the history. See? Like we said, some of the things can be applied to the papacy, but not all. Not all, not everything here. No se puede aplicar. Notice what Daniel in the Revelation said about these verses. Uh, Daniel in the Revelation. Es un libro que un pionero escribió. The king here introduced cannot denote the same power which was last noticed. Namely, the papal power. For the specifications will not hold good if applied to that power. Take a declaration in the next verse. Nor regard any God. This has never been true of the papacy. God and Christ, though often placed in a false position, have never been professedly set aside and rejected from the system of all religion. The only difficulty in applying, in, um, applying it to a new power lies in the definite article, the, for it is urged that the expression, the king, would definitely identify this as the one last spoken of. Entonces, la única dificultad, dice, que la palabra uh, the, no sé cómo dice en, en español, Daniel 11, 45, digo, 11, 36, ajá, de Daniel, ¿Qué dice? Y el rey hará su voluntad. Dice en su será. Dice y agradecerá sobre todo el Dios. Uh -huh. Y contra todo el Dios de los dioses. Hablará maravillas. Y prosperará hasta que sea consumada la ira. Porque lo determinado se cumplirá. Uh -huh. Ok, entonces la palabra el rey okay. y el rey. Es la única dificultad, de acuerdo a lo que dice, porque hace entender como si está hablando del rey que es anterior, y ese fue el papado. Pero es la única dificultad. Aparte de eso, todo lo demás no cabe con el papado. No cabe. Ok, dice. Um, if it could be properly, if it could be properly translated, a king... There would be no difficulty. And it is said that some of the best biblical critics give it this rendering. Mead, Wintel, Bithroad, and others translating the passage. A certain king shall do according to his will. Thus, clearly introducing a new power upon the stage of action. Okay. Entonces, en vez de y el rey. Un cierto rey. Cambra, cambiaría todo. Porque ya es otro rey. ¿verdad? No da a entender que fue el anterior. Y es la... De acuerdo a algunos que lo han estudiado. Y ya llegaron a esa conclusión. ¿verdad? Que es otro rey. Ahora nota este... Uh, notice this quote. Um, says, stealing the light of heaven. You have also taken from their connection portion of the testimonies which the Lord has given for the benefit of his people and have misapplied them to support of your erroneous theories, borrowing, stealing the light of heaven to teach that which the testimonies have no harmony with and have ever condemned. Thus, you have placed both the scripture and testimony in the framework of error. Entonces dice, eso de aplicar la, las profecías de una forma errónea, tratando de ponerle 
un significado que no pertenece, dice que es como robarle la luz a Dios. ¿Sí? Uh -huh. Es lo que está dando a entender. Y también se hace lo mismo con los escritos de la hermana White. Nota, está escrito, it is written, the opinions of men are many and varied in regard to the interpretation of scripture, but the scriptures are not changed to suit men's ideas. Las escrituras no se cambian para, para, para dar este, to suit them, uh, to, to suit men's ideas para que quede de acuerdo a las ideas de los hombres. ¿Sí? The blessed book is yea and amen. It remains firm, eternal. The commentaries of men do not all agree, but the great and blessed facts remain the same. God's word is immutable. It is written. Okay, entonces tenemos que Tomar en cuenta que los hombres cometen errores a, a diario. 100%. Pero la Biblia nunca es. Nunca va a estar erro, uh, errada. Nada. Simplemente tenemos que decir, como dice, como dijo Jesús, está escrito. Para no tal lo que es el pecado de la iglesia católica the sin of the catholic of the roman catholic church all who are in error do as you have done it is the great sin of the roman catholic church this bringing evidence from scripture and from the fathers to sustain false theories okay si entendimos lo que leímos dice es el gran pecado de la iglesia católica en esto, trayendo evidencia de las escrituras y de los padres de la iglesia para sostener uh, teorías falsas. But does the Bible give any foundation to these claims? No. Indeed, it cannot because the structure they rear is founded in error. Will such ones admit anything in the scriptures to be true, which correctness their wrong theory? Let me read that again. Will such ones admit anything in the scriptures to be true, which corrects their wrong theory? This is a, the, our pride doesn't allow us. Uh, el orgullo a veces no nos deja aceptar la verdad. No, for they do as did the Jewish nation. Hacen lo mismo que lo que hicieron los judíos. Uh -huh. Pervertir las escrituras. They pervert the scriptures to sustain false theories. Okay. Porque se olvidan de que la Biblia se explica así sola. We, we need faith in the testimonies. Tener fe en los testimonios, dice... You do not have real faith in the testimony. If you did, you would have received those which pointed out your delusion. Muchos dicen que creen en lo que dijo la hermana White. Sin embargo, con sus acciones, niegan lo que ella dijo acerca de las reglas, de cómo debemos estudiar, lo que ella creía en cuanto a la personal, personalidad de Dios lo que ella creía acerca de los, las profecías de Daniel, niegan lo que ella escribió, diciendo que creen, pero realmente nunca creyeron, ni creen. Porque ellos siguen creyendo en otras cosas, que no están en la Biblia. SDA Positions, la posición de la iglesia adventista. Satan has arranged things so that you should be ensnared. O sea, Satanás va acomodando las cosas para que nosotros caigamos en sus trampas. Fanaticism, deception, a strong and strong delusion holds you captive and same snare. You have talked your ideas in your family. 
misinterpreting scripture, wresting the word of God from its true interpretation, and have thus led them to believe that the views held and advocated by the people are not correct. Your interpretations of scriptures are not in harmony with the positions taken by Seventh day Adventists. Ahora, muchos pueden usar, many can use this. Y decir, ya ves, ahí está diciendo que, el, que el, tienes que estar de acuerdo con la iglesia adventista del séptimo día. Pero la iglesia adventista del séptimo día de hoy no era la iglesia de la cual ella pertenecía. Las doctrinas que ella estaba hablando aquí no son de la que hoy es. No. Exactamente. Entonces, para llegar a la conclusión correcta acerca de las creencias de la iglesia adventista, tendríamos que ir a la iglesia que ella pertenecía. A las verdades que ella estaba enseñando, que ellos estaban enseñando en aquel entonces, antes de su muerte. Porque después de su muerte, que fue en 1915, de ahí en adelante fueron cambiando las cosas. Mm -hmm. So, many might want to use this quote right here to say, you see, you have to go by what the Seventh-day Adventist Church teaches. But what the church teaches today is not what the church taught back then when she was alive. And so in order for us to understand what she's saying, mm -hmm. we have to go back to the beliefs of those that were alive when she was alive. Because she, very, she said in her own self that many would come in with false doctrines after her death. They would come in like wolves in sheep clothing. And that's exactly what has taken place. But if nobody was there to tell you, you wouldn't have known it. And you would have believed that the Seventh-day Adventist Church of today is teaching the truth because of this quote. And so in order for us to know what she's saying, we need to go back to what she was believing. What she, what her and the pioneers we're teaching because that's what she's referring to she's not referring to the beliefs of today your false interpretations have also affected those who are ignorant of our faith okay and that's the end of our presentation okay our prayer is that each and every one of us would use the rules and as you will see from here on that's what we will be doing we're going to study the prophecies of daniel and the revelation and throughout the whole bible to come to a better conclusion of what the prophecies are and as you shall remember as well we read and studied that we need to study it according not to my understanding but as God has given it uh, to those that actually gave these messages. Um, William Miller and his associates giving the first and second angels messages. We're going to start there. And then those that went forward after 1844, October 22nd, 1844, they, get, they were given also the message and so on and so forth. We're going to go... Uh, message by message, making sure that we understand what these messages are as they were given back to our pioneers. May God bless you and thank you for joining us. We hope to um, have you join in our future presentations.